This week was supposed to be the start of Donald Trump's federal election interference trial in Washington, D.C. But instead of proceedings in Judge Tanya Chutkin's courtroom on Monday, what we got was an expedited ruling by the Supreme Court saying states cannot remove Donald Trump from their ballots for engaging in insurrection under the 14th Amendment. And today, the court announced that it will hear oral arguments over Trump's presidential immunity claim seven weeks from now, on April 25th, which is the very last day of the court's term. Joining me now is Sherilyn Eiffel, endowed chair in civil rights at Howard University. I should also note she filed an amicus brief in the Trump ballot case, which was, of course, recently decided by the court. Um, it's great to see you. Thank you for being here Good in New York. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to tell me the good news, because I think it's truly <laughs> bad news here. Um, the very last day of the court's term is when they're going to hear this immunity claim, contrasted with the relatively quick time frame for the 14th Amendment ruling. How do you interpret that decision? It's very much consistent with this court's um, refusal to be moved from the uh, narrative as it has tried to create that we are somehow impervious to the politics of what's happening around us. And this is one of their ways of doing it, pretending that they don't understand the urgency, the reason why American voters would want to know whether the, one of the candidates for president has been convicted uh, of a crime. And so what they do is they just carry on business as usual. And I, I suspect to their mind, they think that it is carrying forward a narrative of impartiality. Mm -hmm. They think that we are so deluded that we believe that they are just sticking to the timetable, sticking to the line, not letting politics move them. And we know that that is not true. We know that they can move quickly when they want to move quickly, and they move slowly when they want to move slowly. And so, um, you know, it's consistent with what they have demonstrated, but it's incredibly cynical. Yeah. Oh, can I take it one step further and assign some more nefarious, sure. <laughs> <laughs> nefarious ends to that, which is, you know, speeding up a decision on the 14th Amendment helped Trump. Slowing down the immunity claim helps Trump. I mean, there's a there's a thread here that sort of makes sense if you look at it through a political lens. Yeah, I don't think the way the Supreme Court has approached the timing of any of these cases suggests taking seriously how much their failure to um, uh, acquiesce to the urgency of the moment itself undermines democracy and the electoral process. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, particularly with the 14th Amendment case coming the day before Super Tuesday, I mean, one might call that quick. I'm not sure that I would. Um, I, I would say that their whole approach to that case showed a kind of laissez-faire mm. at the oral argument. I've said I did, they didn't sound prepared. Um, they did the most cursory review of the history, which is why so much of it was wrong. I mean, th there's just a lack of seriousness. And I think, Alex, I've said this before, the moment that we're in in this country, which is a time of democratic crisis, yeah. requires us all to be big, you know, to be bigger uh, than what we were and to meet the moment. And this court, it, the majority of this court is not prepared to meet the moment. They are scrabbling. Yeah. Even the fact that Clarence Thomas was part of the 14th Amendment decision, uh, if you cared about our democracy, the integrity of the court, the legitimacy of decision making, uh, it, it, the, the conflicts are abound. Yeah. And he should not have been part of that decision. But they can't help it. And then you see the ham fistedness, right? It's a procurium decision. No one wants to assign their name to it. Uh, there's the illusion that it's unanimous. I mean, I suppose it is unanimous, but it's not really. Right. You have the concurring justices who are like given the one two punch and saying to me what has been the most. Um, serious, harsh, and I think not really um, given enough attention statement about what's going on with the majority on that court. And I will say nothing has shaken me as much as the language in that concurrence. The suggestion that the conservative justices on the court are basically trying to shield future insurrectionists. I can't even say suggestion. They said Explicitly. the majority attempts to insulate all alleged insurrectionists from future challenges to their, to their holding federal office. Attempts assigns intentionality yeah. to that majority. That should frighten all of us. We should be sitting with that, that people say, well, why didn't they dissent? I mean, I would have liked for them to dissent, at least dissent in part as well. But they are telling us 
in no uncertain terms, as clearly as they possibly... These are not wild-eyed folks. These are their colleagues on the court, and yeah. we have seen them try to toe the line, try to maintain relationships, try to be as careful as possible. And when they make a statement like that, if we refuse to pay attention to what they are telling us is happening on the court, that is on us, not on the majority. Even Amy Coney Barrett, the one conservative woman on the court, um, who, of course, tries to, you know, scold the women by saying we shouldn't air our dirty laundry. But she says even she didn't think the decision had to go that far. The only reason she's telling us that is because they obviously were having conversations yeah. behind the scenes in which she, too, was hoping that the guys would be able to control themselves and restrain themselves enough to just uh, issue the, the decision in the parameters in which they needed to. So you've got four women yeah. <laughs> saying... Raising, ringing the alarm bell loudly. In and the we're way... all going on and saying, well, but it was 9-0 and it doesn't matter and this is not what's important in any way. It's, you know, Section 3 and it's after the Civil War. And it's like, there is a bell ringing, folks, yeah. and they are telling us. The other part of it that's so, hip, like, just profoundly hypocritical is this is the court that ruled in 2013 in Shelby County that that's, that Congress did not have the constitutional power under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to enforce the Voting Rights Act. Well, they, And now, in the same amendment, they're saying, oh, it's all up to well, Congress to enforce they, this they part of the... They said something a little different, but, you know, with the same result in, in, in the uh, Shelby County versus Holder case in 2013. What they did was exactly what they would do if Congress does pass a statute implementing <laughs> Section 3, which was to say, not quite this way. Don't do it this way, right? right. So Congress has a coverage formula for preclearance pre under the Voting Rights right. Act and reauthorizes that formula after hearings, after amassing evidence. And the Supreme Court says, no, 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 we don't think that's right because we believe, as the court says in that case, the majority, that things have changed dramatically. Yes, there's no racism right. anymore, Cheryl. And now we see the stories in the, in, the, in the papers this week, all of the studies that are being done that show that the turnout gap has increased again in those places where preclearance was removed. They don't know better. Congress does know better, which is why they have the power. So even when the court concedes that Congress has power, then they then they proceed to tell Congress how to use yes. that power. In fact, in this decision, in this one too. Right, they said it has to be legislation, and that legislation has to specifically say this and that, right? So it's a power grab in every way, and it is deference to Congress in name only. This is... The 14th Amendment is one of, for, to my mind, the most important provision of our Constitution for the way we live our modern lives in this country, our post-Civil War lives. And to see this Supreme Court chip away at it, undermine it, subvert it, take it as their own. The times that that happened in the past, in the 19th century, in, in, the, in the Reconstruction period, resulted in devastation for our democracy, whether it was Plessy versus Ferguson, whether it was the civil rights cases in 1883. These were all circumstances in which the Supreme Court undermined Congress's power um, to, to issue uh, statutes in accordance with the 14th Amendment. And every time they did it, I mean, they ushered in Jim Crow yep. for 60 years in this country. So honestly, when we see the Supreme Court doing this, when we see them subverting a provision of the Constitution that those framers, the only framers in the history of this country who have looked insurrection in the eye yep. and overcome it and stitched back together a broken nation, when we see them do this, we should understand this is an emergency moment for our democracy. Yeah, and that emergency, we are going to talk in a coming block about just how crystal clear it is and how very much at our doorstep that emergency Absolutely. is. Sherilyn, please hang with me if you can for a few more minutes. Minutes still.